Eh, io parlerò in italiano e, e Peter Kubelka e Alexander Robert in inglese, quindi ehm, sono molto felice di questo, di questo incontro che è un'occasione abbastanza straordinaria per poter parlare del lavoro delle cineteche e per poter parlare con le due persone che hanno diretto, uh, uh, che hanno diretto il Westerwerfi Museum. Uh, di solito una cineteca che ha 50 anni uh, ha molti più direttori, ha uh, una storia eh, meno lineare eh, e quindi credo che questa linearità sia anche una delle ragioni del, del successo e, eh, e della, della capacità di continuare un progetto eh, che osservando la storia eh, del nostro Arche Museum mi sembra uno degli elementi di assoluta forza quindi abbiamo uno dei due fondatori e il, il, il nuovo uh, direttore. E, allora io comincerei da te Peter e eh, vorrei che ci raccontassi come è, è nata l'idea, uh, uh, come mai avete immaginato assieme a Collecner di, di creare uh, la, questa, questa, questa cineteca, questa idea bizzarra. Ma... Uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, I was a filmmaker uh, for more than 10 years before the film museum was started, and, uh, and I saw, I witnessed the situation in Vienna, which was dreadful. Uh, it was impossible to see the important works of film history. Uh, there was an institution already working at work, but they had few and bad uh, projections and uh, the, the point of view was only to glorify national uh, production. So the situation was very bad. I attempted on several occasions um, to uh, import or to bring in films and show them and it was a very discouraging uh, thing. Um, Paul Lechner, my partner then for all these years in the Film Museum, uh, was a student at the Technical University and he had started to uh, do a, a film club and he also uh, then started a kind of a festival and he approached me uh, at, at a point in time when I already had given up sort of hope to do something really, to, to continue this way of, of doing a, a little something here and a little something there. So I, I helped him for, uh, I gave him suggestions uh, which films would be interesting and uh, we started a kind of collaboration and then um, uh, I, I said uh, I don't want to continue like this but let's do something uh, let's do the thing which is necessary. Let's, let's, let's uh, do as if we had a big uh, sponsor and a big party behind us and we just found what is necessary. <laughs> and so we founded the film museum. Um, in the, in, we didn't, in fact, we had already the t title museum because, uh, of course, the, the, the place of the muses. And, uh, but we didn't dare, and, and, uh, and we had to apply for a title, and then we, we applied for a film institute, and then they refused, and, and um, I mean, we had a, the wind against us really for all those years which we ran the film museum uh, from official side. And, uh, and then they said, no, institute, no, but you can call it film museum. And we said, yes, <laughs> we call it Film Museum. Uh, uh, that's that's <laughs> what we want anyway. 
So we did it, and uh, we had no backing, no official backing, no political party, no rich sponsors, but we had a public which was really hungry for uh, to see films, to see the films. They had the same hunger that we had, and and so we were able to exert pressure on the on the government, on the ministry, and but they never gave us a real budget. It was a fact. Every year we were sort of uh, uh, half in prison because we had to to uh, start planning, and the, and they never gave us the money until half of the next year. So we never knew what we would get, and and this lasted until in the end, uh, uh, Horvath, uh, uh, which uh, became our successor and was the, su the successor of my and our my choice. Uh, they tried also to shoot him down, and 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 they they cut down the, the subsidy, and and it, it was always a fight. Uh, we always had a polemical uh, position, and in a way, I think it was good because we were not subject to orders. Nobody could order us which retrospective to make or what we would do. Uh, our money was scarce, but we 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 did what we believed in and. The public supported us. E, Alexander, e, ci puoi eh, raccontare invece eh, che cosa ti ha portato a, al Film Museo? E che cosa ti ha portato al Film Museo e anche che cosa tu conoscevi? del film museum eh, prima di diventare direttore. What brought me to the film museum was a, a public tender in the papers in, in uh, late the year 2000, in early 2001. Several people applied. The founders were, were announcing that they would retire by the end of 2001. Um, some people applied. Mr. Kubelka told me that he would be happy if I applied, and I did apply, and in the end they picked me in, in mid-2001, and I, I started uh, work on January, officially I started work on January 1st, 2002, but had already, as Mr. Kubelka indicated, had already quite a lot to do with not having the place destroyed by outside forces uh, in the half year before, because you should remember at the time this was when the, the so-called center-right coalition, which was more like a right and very right coalition in Austria, reigned, and they had many different plans about cultural politics uh, than the previous government, so it was quite a fight for those first years. I had known the Film Museum, of course, much, much earlier, and I had come for the first time in the late 70s as a teenager uh, to, to uh, various retrospectives, um, more the, at first more the American genre retrospectives and later on when I began my studies in, in 83, at, at 18 I also was immediately transfixed by the chance to see independent filmmakers, avant-garde filmmakers present their own work, speak about their work in very different ways, see more or less for the first time that kind of work. I was I was had not had a big knowledge about non commercial or non 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 popular let's say the non popular genres. So I, I saw Mr. Kubelka's lectures and presentations but many, many other filmmakers and then also at other places. I should add that I'm typically as I think many in my generation not someone, I'm already, I already belong to a generation that was not only uh, educated about film history through theatrical screenings. My education or knowledge about film history already drew from many, many sources, not, maybe not as many as exist today, but already at the time, uh, German television stations, sometimes also Austrian television uh, showed films. We got cable TV, my, my parents early on and there was VHS, so as, as crummy and strange and unfitting these other these formats and these transfers of films may have been, 
uh, I did see about half of, of, of the films that I know and, and when I started watching intensely at 14, 15 years of age, I saw many in those ways and I saw many at cinemas and I saw many at the film museum. So it's a, a bastard type uh, education as is even more radically so I think for everyone today who <coughs> educates themselves about film history. Uh, I should add that even though I, I was fine with that bastard situation, and I still am in a way, it was the, the recognition and the realization of how the Austrian Film Museum and a few other places in other cities that I visited later on, the way they dealt with film history, the way you could see films there, the intensity and... and, and, and To the exclusion of, I mean, this is the whole notion of the invisible cinema that, that Mr. Kubelka devised very early on and first realized in, in 1970 in New York and later on also in, in Vienna at the Film Museum. But the, the invisible cinema is only a, for me, it's, it's a metaphor for a certain exclusivity is the wrong word because it, it, it relates to something like the elite and we, it's not what I mean. Exclusivity, excluding the various other things that life also has and that are nice when you watch a film on TV you you do not exclude uh, eating while watching and there are all these elements of life around you and the same and even the more so when you have your iPad and you sit wherever you sit you have you watch a film while life goes on the great and it's not it's not I'm not I'm not feeling it in a religious or mythical or any 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 of these senses but really the devotion and the the eye level meeting, the meeting between me and the film at eye level that you can get at a great cinematech screening is the, certainly the most intense and the most impressionable, if that's the term, way to, to watch films. So even having this bast bastard education, I did feel already from the very first time at the film museum that this is how I want to, how I ideally would want to see everything. So in that sense, I can only say I'm very happy that I ended up at that place also professionally and, and was given the chance to, to, to lead it and to run it uh, since 12 and a half years. Grazie, Alexander. E, Peter, mi vorrei soffermare ancora un momento sul tema della successione, che è un tema chiave perché è un, una cineteca è comunque un'istituzione complessa e, e quindi arriva un momento nel quale eh, i fondatori si allontanano e, e questo momento molto spesso nella storia del, delle cineteche che è una storia pur breve ma abbiamo pure tanti esempi è stato un momento a volte drammatico eh, e questa separazione del fondatore dal, dal dall'istituzione dalla che aveva creato è stata anche molto dolorosa ed è durata poi questa separazione molto a lungo allora ti vorrei chiedere come hai maturato la decisione di abbandonare la tua creatura e come hai immaginato che la vita, potesse, la vita di questa istituzione potesse proseguire e come uh, well. <coughs> Uh, what you suggested that uh, if you hand over something you created to somebody else and even if it's uh, your own son and I see uh, <laughs> <laughs> are we making a deep secret public a Bologna si scoprono cose incredibili well uh, uh, Sun in spirit, whatever. Uh, uh, as, I, as was already said, uh, uh, Horvath was the success of my choice, and I am very happy that uh, under his uh, guiding, the film museum is really flourishing, and, and is there, and is a factor, and there are young people uh, there, and so uh, it's fine. But of course, and uh, I knew that uh, differences would, in opinion, would arise, and that uh, I thought very thoroughly on that. And uh, my decision 
<coughs> was that I would quit and I would go uh, completely. I would not even seek uh, friendly advice, nothing. I would, I would say, here it is, and it's, it's there. And I learned that from, in my youth, from, I grew up in the country, and the farmers, this was how the farmers would give the farm to the sun. Uh, there was the handover day, and on the next day, the former chief is the grandfather and has nothing to say anymore. If he wants an additional piece of bread, he must ask his daughter-in-law if he can have another a piece of bread. You know, this, this situation is wise because it, it gives the next one uh, a free head and a free uh, freedom to act and, and to set up what, what he believes in. Um, if I may say, for example, now that I have stated uh, that, and um, if I would found a, a, a cinematheque today, uh, I have certain ideas which uh, are not, of course, I will not try to impose on, on um, Alexander, because there is also, and that's the problem with my vision, uh, there is the reality and there, are, there is the rea real public, the public you have. For example, as, as, as a speaker, I have, I have seen the change of the public since I started uh, uh, 40 years ago, because now half of the people who, who are listening to some uh, uh, are texting while you speak and also ruined from television, from loudspeakers. Because if, if, if you speak through a loudspeaker, nothing can disturb you, you see? So the public, there is no comparison between, also in music, when you give a, a, a concert which is not enhanced electronically today, you have great problems. Because people think of nothing you make uh, and, and, and do these things. So the public is changing, you see? There's a new situation you face. So my vision of a, of a film archive or a film museum, as it was partly also uh, realized in, in the old uh, um, Österreichische Film Museum, is a film museum, the parallel to a film museum is the university, not the whole family on Sunday afternoon, which means uh, uh, the, the obligation, the film museum should be paid by the state and has an obligation toward the education of future film makers and future film goers. Uh, it has not the obligation to entertain in a wrong way because uh, if you study mathematics, and you, are, you have your mathematic books, there are no funny illustrations in between uh, uh, the numbers. The numbers are entertaining enough if you understand them. If you, if you do something and you do it right, it's entertaining enough. If you, are in an, if you deal with archaeology, when you have a stone from, uh, which is uh, 600,000 years old, uh, uh, it's not necessary to clean it, to paint it with nice uh, ornaments, to put it on a pillow or something, uh, because you would ruin the message that this stone can have to you unclean. So, I'm against uh, changing any uh, historic film material. I'm against putting music uh, onto an, a film which has been made 50 years ago because this music would ruin the historicity of the material which you are going to show. I mean, there, is, there are other things which are, if the, the, the time frame is not enough to, to go into it. I don't think that uh, because <coughs> silent films have been accompanied historically by, by bad pianists, who, 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 who had to earn a little something, that this makes the medium, uh, uh, makes it, a, a, uh, makes it uh, mandatory that we do this now. 
because they, they, the great achievement in cinema was, if the films were achievements, was were visually only. Dreyer, Buñuel, uh, uh, when you see the versions that have been composed uh, meticulously to, to, let's say, the Jean d'Arc in Denmark, which I have had the misfortune to have to listen to, um, um, show two things. They show a, a, an incredible, important modern work of art in the visual. And in the sound, they show a, a petty, provincial, Danish, second-rate composer who fiddled something with it. Uh, so, of course, I mean, uh, sound film, uh, a silent film that has no sound is, in a way, problematic. But I would choose the form to say, let's look at it as it is. And, if, and all these arguments that people don't like silence, I would ignore. We have ignored that during all those uh, more than 40 years that we ran the film museum. No film has ever been shown with uh, piano music. Uh, other things we have, we have done, and which I would do again, I would like to, uh, to be polemically for uh, the acceptance of cinema as a major complete form of art, not a reproduction of 19th century uh, theater, melodrama, uh, dialogue, stories, actors, uh, uh, and so on. <clears throat> uh, which today also make up for 99% of, of what is there. But this, the history of cinema as a means to uh, enable new thinking in mankind as the Renaissance painting has uh, created the concept of human dignity, for example, against the medieval concept of uh, God's tormented creatures uh, uh, bleeding. Uh, 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 and so cinema has uh, made it uh, possible uh, to say there is a post-cinema mankind uh, uh, and, and there is a pre-cinema mankind, a uh, pre-cinematic thinking. And these important works uh, are not the works of the mainstream. This is very important. So, in my, in my film museum, the mainstream is when, if ever, represented and on a low uh, interest. <coughs> also, uh, the star, the actors, for example, which dominate uh, film history. You know, I, I was polemically against featuring actors as decisive factors for the films I, we would show. We would show films after makers, directors, if they were uh, uh, examples of errors of the industry. A good film is always an error that occurs in the industry. By, uh, as I said, the uh, uh, of Lushenko, uh, 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 mistakes. Um, <clears throat> we never ever staged a, a retrospective uh, for an actor or an actress because I believe the actors are in film not, a, not an important factor. They are interchangeable. The only, the only decisive factor as to the quality of the film is uh, the, 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 the maker. The film is the star. The film is the star, not it, like in painting. It, it, you are not interested in uh, who was painted by, by Van Gogh. Uh, this is completely irrelevant. It's important that it, Van Gogh has painted it, because then you see the cosmic storm behind a, a bunch of flowers or behind the, the hat of a, of a postman. Another thing is uh, my stance to toward digital restoration. Um, just a very short example. When Kennedy was killed, there was a little an amateur who shot a little film. His name was Zabruda. And he shot this 8 millimeter film. And this film was used as a testimony in the court proceedings of who killed, who, who killed, where 
the shots came from, and, and they looked at the film and they determined where the shots came from. Would this film have been restored, restorated, under things marks, digitally, this film could not have appeared as testimony in court because a digitally restored <coughs> film is not a film anymore, it's an animated film. Every digital event is an animated event created by, by a uh, set of numbers which can be changed. So in the, the digitally restored Zabruder film could have featured uh, King Kong sitting <laughs> in the car uh, uh, and, 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 and Greta Garbo as his wife <laughs> and, and the shots coming from the other direction and the car changed from Chrysler into a Mercedes. Yeah? Which means, uh, the only thing I want to prove with this example, that the digital, a, a, a digitally uh, uh, created work is not cinema. There are, these are two media. And I, I declare I'm not against it. I have an iPad, use it every day. Uh, uh, I use the computer, but it, this goes only for film. Analog film is a medium which is complete and, and uh, <coughs> this transition, seemingly, seemingly peaceful and with no position moving, is a trick, or, and, and is uh, a part of a, I, let me use this expression, of genocide, because it kills culture. In, in, in Holland, uh, the, the company Pate, who has equipped their theaters with, uh, with uh, new digital equipment, has forced the people who ran these cinemas to destroy the analog, the analog equipment. You see, this is a, a war of industries, of money, um, <coughs> but it's not a peaceful uh, succession. Therefore, my advice in the future for film museums one thing is, I would recommend the foundation of film museums and film archives who limit themselves to analog film. Those who do not, I would encourage to strongly separate what they present, what they preserve and present between the analog film and digital film. Tell it in big letters every time you show something with, with a digital projection. And make the fight for the acceptance of the difference. You see, this is what the polemic has to be. The polemic has because film will not go under. It will not go under for many reasons. One is coming from, very, from the very people who destroyed film, namely the, the Hollywood people who found out that there is no longevity in the digital medium. A digital uh, uh, preservation, you have to migrate every three years. After seven years, uh, it, the, the machines go out, uh, the, the machines are obsolete, and you have to have new machines. The costs are incredible. And this does not come from me as an independent filmmaker. This comes from the owners of the big company in Hollywood. And Kodak already has a, a now stock which uh, uh, enables you uh, them to preserve their digitally produced things on film. This is one hope. Because we have to keep alive the labs. We have to, uh, to ensure the, 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 uh, the, the, the staying alive of all those machines, which are simple machines, archaic machines. I mean, these are, uh, 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 <coughs> this is very, very, it's very archaic, you see. I can look through and I know, ah, this is, this is, this. Uh, I can read it with naked eyes. Yeah. And this is what the film archives preserve, not content, not content. The content is linked to this, these things and these they have to preserve. So um, I'm against all restoration 
uh, on, on digital, with a digital medium. If you transfer a film for digi on the digital, maybe to show it in television or, or to entertain children who cannot see scratches uh, or uh, uh, things like that, okay, do it. But don't call it a restoration. Don't call it preservation. It's not. It's not preservation. Okay, I see that the time, and I, I rest my case for the moment. <coughs> allora, sì, eh, diciamo, hai bruciato tutte le domande che io avevo preparato. Ah. E però è stato un bellissimo quiz, una bellissima performance. <ride> e quindi è per questo oh, oh, oh. che... Va sì, bene, un comizio, un comizio, un comizio. È stato un bellissimo quiz. E, ed è per questo che non, non ti ho spezzato e, e, e interrotto. E, e Alexander, eh, eh, ci puoi dire... Eh, eh, adesso ci puoi descrivere brevemente eh, che cos'è il, il film museum, eh, che cosa conserva e, e che tipo di, di attività fa e anche farci capire qual è, eh, quali sono i problemi, anche i problemi economici e, e, poi, eh, e poi ti chiederei invece di, di eh, rispondere ad alcune delle, delle cose che ha detto Peter, in particolare la questione dell'accompagnamento dei film muti e, e poi la grande questione del digitale. Um, I hope that by describing what, what I think the film museum is, I can also uh, comment on, on the second part of, of your question, because uh, uh, certain policies or certain, how should I say, convictions that the founders of the institution uh, built the museum on, I, I fully share and our staff shares and, and we try to uh, bring them into the future. Um, other, I mean this is not maybe convictions, but other policies or other ways to do things we, we see differently and we do differently. Uh, and by describing the uh, arc, uh, the, yeah, the fan, the arc uh, of things we do, maybe I can I can address some of these issues. When I have to go back to the beginning when I when I started, because when I started the yearly budget uh, of the film museum in this, as I mentioned, in this also politically quite tough moment, it was also tough because. The Film Museum is an autonomous institution renting space in, a, in an old part of the Imperial Castle in Vienna that is called the Albertina Building, and where the famous Albertina uh, Museum, Albertina Collection is housed, but we are completely autonomous. The Albertina and, and the Film Museum are both uh, rent from the Republic of Austria, and that, that battle with the Albertina was, was sort of another battle. So this, this situation was quite tough, and the, and the yearly budget was, as you asked about budget, was around 750,000 euro, complete yearly budget. Um, at the moment, if I compare correctly, the Austrian Film Museum still belongs to the, to the minor, or to the, not minor, to the smaller European film archives and, and film museums. Uh, but at least the budget has reached a level of 2.1 million uh, euro. So that's just for factual, the factual side of it. Um, when, when we began preservation work, copying films, creating new prints was practically impossible. The staging of, uh, of larger retrospectives where many, many prints would have to come from many, many sources and rights holders was impossible because the money wasn't there. And since the understanding of the film museum as a place where the cinema is the museum space, it says so on the outside, when you come to the, this is something that Mr. Kohnlechner and Mr. Kubelka said from the very beginning, even before the film museum was founded, the exhibition space of the film museum is the screen. And I, I, I believe that to a degree I cannot even mention that this is the only valid understanding of the film museum. Uh, where the films are being shown. So the, this space, the, the cinema and the program, what is being shown, the actual exhibitions on screen are 
in a way, at the real core of, of what we do, uh, as opposed to an institution that sees itself more like an archive, where the archival and the preservation aspect is more important than the presenting aspect, by for whichever reasons historically, having picked that name, Film Museum, I think the institution gave itself the obligation to think hard about what that means. And by placing the cinema, a simple, beautiful black cinema, as its actual museum space where the films are presented, it fulfills that obligation. So we decided early on that any raise in budget, any, <coughs> any the first, first successes we would have in, in finding sources of, of income would have to protect this core of presenting programs the way they should be presented. Never ever leave a film out of the program just because it's too expensive to bring it from Taiwan. Never ever uh, uh, or or never ever show a Blu-ray of a film just because it's twenty it only costs you twenty five euro as opposed to maybe two thousand five hundred if you have to pay the rights and ship it from the other end of the world and so on. So, you know, it's not that we it think it sounds more luxurious than it is, but uh, I don't think we overspend and we try to be very uh, economical, but we never save money uh, in terms of the exhibition. It, 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 if it needs to be, here's a difference with Mr. Kubelka, we do subtitle, let's say, an, an, a film in Hindi or a film in Portuguese or a film in French, the only films we do not subtitle uh, are English language, original prints, or German prints. But generally, if we, if for an Italian or, or Chinese film, we, we receive a, an original version print, we create with no with no subtitles on the print, we create German or English language uh, soft titles electronic. So this this is a cost issue, but we this is there's never the question of not doing that. Um, so that's one one thing is the one thing was historically to, to to protect the budget for this so that the exhibitions can shine and that the that what curatorially we think we want we have to present the ways we have to 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 structure <coughs> our film historical <coughs> offers and presentations that those are not are not uh, hindered by by economic means secondly looking at the collection um, which for a certain period in the in the 90s, late 80s and 90s, very, very little, there were important and, and in some cases quite famous uh, restoration projects like Peter Kubelka uh, reconstructing Bertov's enthusiasm, which is rightly known and which was also our first DVD release in 2005. And I'm happy to say it won the DVD award that year in Bologna. Um, there were several uh, preservations before but the money was not enough, as I said. So we, 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 and we try to analyze the collection and see where are the, the strengths. You asked what, what, what is the collection. It is definitely not one of the big collections. I know for a fact, <coughs> compared to, let's say, the Cinematheque Suisse or the Cinematheque Royale in, in Belgium or those Filmofon and, and many, many others, American archives, the Film Museum has a relatively small collection. Um, but for, for, for the... <coughs> hundreds of reasons, very specific subjective reasons, acquisitions, but also, as anyone who runs an archive knows, the reasons why something ends up in, in your collection are really manifold. Um, but certain core elements had become, uh, when very, very quickly when I analyzed the collection, were very obvious. Independent filmmaking played a strong role, definitely due to, to Mr. Kubelka's own work and his knowledge of that field and his close relationship to, to, to independent avant-garde filmmakers around the world. So both Austrian, uh, European and American uh, avant-garde film, the new American cinema, at least up to, I would say, up to the 70s, to a certain generation, it dropped off, let's say, in the, in the, in the 80s, 1980s generation, but was really is, is really well represented. An important case, for instance, are the films of Gregory Markopoulos and Robert Beavers, which were continuously acquired, collected, preserved, partly preserved by the Film Museum. Uh, uh, a more recent case of something that was not in the collection when I began was the acquisition of all the original materials of James Benning's works, who would be a, a representative of a later, somewhat later generation. So uh, this is already an example that we try to continue these core elements. The Soviet 
the 1920s and the early 30s Soviet collection, the Austrian avant-garde collection, the New American Cinema collection, a topic that had <coughs> developed only a bit later, but Stroheim and Sternberg were important cases of it early on, was the, what I like to call, and it fits with yesterday's Piazza screening, a sort of the transnational Austria, I think, Mr. Kubelka already mentioned this strange pride that some Austrians have, or this patriotism in, in, in their own film industry. The Austrian film industry, the films produced in Austria, was in some cases interesting, but generally not that interesting, I would say. It only became more interesting in the last 20, 20 or 30 years again. But what I always found fascinating about Austria and, and film history was that there are two, um, how do I call them? Transnational, trans, transterritorial, transterritorial, maybe uh, traditions of filmmaking. One is the avant-garde, which never belonged to the official cinema system. It was a, it, it was in Austria partly. In some ways, it was not because both Mr. Kubelka and Kurt Krenn and many others had to go elsewhere. So the the, the rich and important tradition and unbroken tradition of, of, of avant-garde and independent filmmaking in Austria since the 50s until today is one of these two trans-territorial traditions, and the other is the cinema of exile and emigration. The cinema which for political reasons, uh, but not only, there is already emigration, and Stroheim and Sternberg are good examples, that is, that happens, that happened in almost all European countries, uh, already before that, the Nazi era, but there is a way in which Austrianness, if you are interested in such a thing, it's a dubious term, I'm aware of it, but in which Filmmaking and Austria are represented by U.S. American productions, French, German, Italian, Russian, whatever. These people ended up, these hundreds and hundreds of filmmaking creatives, people creative in the film industry, including actors and actresses, um, ended up contributing to the cinemas of other countries. And that has become one of the topics of interest for our collection as well as for our programming. Uh, which is which is why which, which is another reason why I was very happy that that, that, that work by Stroheim uh, is represented also in, in this program, but it also goes for, for people like Peter Lorre, for instance, and, and our in our publications in our which brings me to the last element, uh, our publications, our DVD uh, uh, publications, we also try to focus on this, but we do. <clears throat> those those few core elements are surrounded by by a number of, of works from all disciplines, from all not disciplines from all uh, facets facets of cinema, shades of cinema, layers of cinema, and that may be the most as opposed to, to Mr. Kubelka, I would not say that there is the, the the core the real core the art the art of filmmaking and. Opposing it or around it is the industry, is the commercial cinema for pleasure. For me, this, the medium of film is is manifold and is equal. Is it's it isn't essential. It is never essential because it has given over its, its essentialness. You know, it, well, it is essential in its taking its aesthetic technical form, but amateur film, avant-garde film, the anonymous documentary film. Uh, creative documentary film, art, art, art fiction filmmaking, a la Nouvelle Vague, uh, neorealism, Tarkovsky, etc., and commercial fictional filmmaking in the Hollywood example are equally part of what this medium is. There is no, I think it's wrong to, to, to take one of these, or it's, it, maybe it's not wrong, it's, uh, it, it doesn't, for me, it never led anywhere to saying that one of these applications of the medium, it's really, a, it's a medium that has its applications or realizations, and in all these applications and realizations, it can be great. And the Film Museum has the, of the job, I think, to represent all these facets and all these very different ap kinds of applications. So that's what the collection also definitely tries to do, and which which it is very well equipped to do because it has this strong avant-garde uh, layer, it has this layer of documents, of historical documents, most of which don't have an author or, a, or a very strange, can be very strange objects. It has a rich amateur film uh, layer, it collects as well in, in that field, 
and it has a rich layer in, in popular uh, narrative cinema and, and so on. So we try to represent that in the program, but also in the, in the educational or, or publicational activities we, we, we have been able to, to restart in a way in, in from 2004, 2005. And I would say that this is definitely a, th a third equally important element that uh, A would be the museum presentations, the exhibitions on screen, B would be the archival preservation work, the restorations, the co collaborations with other archives in such restoration and preservation projects. And thirdly, it is what we do with students, pupils. We, we have started already in 2002 a, a, a continuous program of, of in this, it's very important, in the cinema, in the theater, showing, like Mr. Kubelka just did, what film is or can be, a very practical, very direct confrontation of young people, both 80-year-olds and 18-year-olds and students, with that medium, with certain questions that the medium brings about. Uh, so that is ongoing, and added to that, books, as, as many of you know, and which have been on present here for, for many, many years, books and, and DVDs, which again focus on, which are never just a film book that comes to our mind, but it's always a book or a DVD that relates to the collection, that comes out of the collection or that deals with a filmmaker important for the collection, uh, and also a book or that, that's, that's related to a big presentation, <coughs> big retrospective. So we try to, to devise this, this lineup of books and DVDs according to, to themes and, and, and questions and issues that we have in, in the other two uh, uh, pillars, pillars uh, of our work. I must admit that I did not touch on the digital issue as you asked me to. Um, I can only say that one, and this is, even though there are many things that, that Mr. Kubelka would, would do differently if he founded the Film Museum today, to my own surprise, one of the, one of the things that we strictly uh, keep on doing is to present like a museum should I think any any museum of any discipline that uh, should present works in the medium in the in the material shape in which they were in which they were made so the film museum to this very day presents uh, a film from from 19 a film from the analog era let's call it that uh, as, a, as a film, as an analog projection, and it would also, which is why we, it was necessary to, to acquire it, the digital cinema setup, uh, works from the more recent era, works that, works that were created uh, digitally, that were created in non-analog fashions, and not only created, but which came, which became his public fact, because we live in a mutational era where both analog and digital technologies intermingle with many with each other during the production of many films in the last 20 years. The, the important fact is the way in which certain things became public. So since a few years, most or all uh, commercial, uh, commercially released works, but also many, many independently made works become public as files, which is why it is important to also present them as files, uh, meaning you have to be able to have digital projection but not to project digitally uh, a film from the 20s or 50s or 70s, but to present current work because I think as, that's my last element, one thing I learned from, from studying the programs of the Film Museum in the 60s and 70s was an amazing awareness of current production. These were two relatively young men, or very young men, they were not yet 30 when they founded the Film Museum, so you, you can see, you can find, both from the independent and avant-garde world, but also from the, let's say, Nouvelle Vague world of, of cinema and documentary cinema, you see the first continental European retrospective of Martin Scorsese in 1975, when he just had made a few uh, feature-length films. You see Jean Estache visiting the Film Museum four times during the 1970s. He had his first retrospective in, in Vienna. You see Werner Schröter being supported incredibly from a very early stage. You see Wiseman, you see in, in the field of documentary, Robert Gardner, you see people before they were globally recognized, they already had a home in the film museum. And this goes of course for many, many of the, of the avant-garde filmmakers, both from Europe and, and 
from 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 the U.S. And even though this this sort of um, went that went this, the number of such shows or the number of presentations of absolutely current work, Bomea was also a case, by the way, early on. While that went down, simply I guess maybe because if you get older, it's it's harder to to stay in complete touch with what what is happening. Uh, at the present moment, and the film museum never had the money to hire uh, curate additional curators to, to follow the, the, the new stuff. Anyway, in, I think in the 80s and 90s this went a little bit down, but for me it was clear that this this is a, a heritage of that institution that I I want to and I need to and I must pick up. So current production figures in in especially in the field of, of, of independent work, but in many other ways uh, equally. So. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because the necessity to to present digitally made work is also a question of do do you want to present what interesting artists working with moving images today produce? And if you do want that, like someone like David O'Reilly, a, a, a wonderful artist, a great the, for me the great art the great artist in moving in digital moving images today, you simply have you cannot tell him. Could you make a 35 or 60 millimeter print for us? That would be as silly as to do it the other way around. So we try to we try to deal with these. I mean, I could I don't want to make it any longer. I do have reasons why I think differently than Mr. Kubelka that film was never as as pure. Film in its beginning was not a pure invention. It came from a dirty and and again I use the word maybe bastard type cultural situation. Film at its beginning imitated uh, other arts. Uh, film became something along the lines and, and, and already in the 50s films began to pop up on television. So this was not cinema, but it was a way for films to exist. So this impurity or this, these constant moments of remediation happen in cultural history and they happen today. And in as much as a film museum and film museums were always interested in looking at pre-cinematic uh, uh, forms of, of creating visual pleasure, the magic lantern and, and many other forms of, of so-called pre-cinematic uh, 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 aesthesis. Uh, they were interesting to film museums. I don't see why it should not be interesting to film museums what happens a hundred years later in this new very intense remediation period where, 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 le where does film leave its traces, even if it's no longer film? film of course leaves its traces in the various digital practices and the digital practices that are being invented or being, being shown also um, reflect back on those artists who still work on film. Peter Tchaikovsky working on film today may go on working only on film today but he is not unimpressed the fact of his, his practice is not, is not uh, closed off from the fact that the media culture around him is a digital media culture. So practicing analog film today, I think this would also go for monument film, uh, practicing those kinds of work today, even if they do not include, and even if they are meant as, as concrete statements for this medium, cannot detach themselves from the fact that they, and what you say shows this, that they happen in, in, a, in a world that's, that's structured differently as far as moving images go. So I'm more interested in, in, in observing and, and following and, and understanding these, 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 the facets of these mutations than, than saying, okay, we, we, we will limit ourselves fully and only to, to analog film. As much as we do not limit ourselves to analog film, considering the late 19th century, I, I think we shouldn't also limit ourselves to analog film as far as the early 21st is concerned. But I agree with Mr. Kubelka that the definition and the core of this museum has been and is the medium of cinema. This museum looks at the world, at cultural history, from the viewpoint of cinema. That's, in, that's the important thing. And not to say, this file will not enter my house. Uh, but what is the viewpoint? If you can make that viewpoint clear, if you can state your case clearly, you won't be contained by including pre-cinematic or post-cinematic uh, types of moving images in, in your collection, in your program. Uh, grazie Alexander. Uh, 
ci rimangono pochi minuti quindi non so se, se tu vuoi fare una replica eh. uh, would be to, it would go on too long because we have discussed our points of view from several locations and, and, and that's not so easy I just want to make maybe one uh, very clear point as to uh, subtitling um, and there uh, you have to keep in mind of, of who, toward whom has a film museum the responsibility. And as I said, responsibility is toward those people who devote their life to uh, cinema, such as like, like people who study medicine because they want to be a doctor. And these people have a right to see the films in their best possible form. A film which has subtitles is practically visually destroyed. Uh, it becomes a, a it becomes uh, the subtitles take the lead in attention getting because they are white. They are stronger than any uh, mont montage in in, uh, in in the in the image. So uh, everybody, if you analyze yourself sitting in a film with subtitles, you read the subtitles. And, 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 and the uh, film itself becomes the background to the subtitles. So, uh, the, on the other hand, you have a Japanese film, and not many people speak Japanese here. Um, I can tell you our practice. We never showed a film with subtitles, including Japanese films, if we could get hold of them. Uh, without subtitles. Um, because, in my view, it is better to see a, a Japanese film and not understanding what people say, uh, which, I mean, as, a, as an apart, is not that great, but not that important, because what will people say? I mean, you, you know always what people say in a certain situation. And films that depend only, that depend only on the dialogue, are not good films. You see, they, these are not the films which, for which the cinema, in my view, the, the film museum is there. An example, when I saw first in Rome, uh, at the Centro Sperimentale, uh, a, a projection of Day of Wrath, uh, Freidstein, by Traia, in Danish, without subtitles, the, 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 the man who showed it was the director at the time, Montesanti, he I have this opinion from him. He was of the opinion that the film should be as it is. There was no subtitles. I saw the film and I knew this was the greatest uh, long feature film I have ever seen. Uh, although I didn't understand the words. I went home and I, I, mem I had the whole film in my memory. I wrote, wrote everything down and then I started to learn Danish. And uh, uh, I, I had seen the film as it was, and I and, and had there been subtitles, yeah, I would have had a, a, a low brow, a, a lower quality, low intensity film. Today, this uh, the, the the film museums don't have even this responsibility because you can get any film in DVD with a choice of subtitles. So if you want to see a Japanese film with subtitles, you buy yourself this little thing, go there and click and have your subtitles. So the film museum, uh, um, but uh, if the film museum who is responsible for the elite, I use this word on purpose, yeah? Because it has, it has acquired a bad sense because of people who claim to be the elite, but an elite is nothing bad. There's nothing bad about people who know a lot, who are capable and who do something. And, and they are few, because uh, there is also an, an elite of football experts that sit uh, and know every move that will happen in three seconds before, and I don't. Uh, uh, um, so uh, the film museum is responsible to present as the only place in the world where a Japanese filmmaker can see a Japanese film without the destruction of uh, subtitles. 
And the others can, as I say, the, 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 this is the changed situation. A film museum, much less than 30 years ago, needs to show subtitles. Subtitles destroy a film. Yeah, you, can, you can tear up a film, you can burn it, or you can subtitle it. That's the recipe. Bene, allora, dicendo che io adoro i sottotitoli, che vado al cinema per vedere i sottotitoli, e voglio ringraziare la radicalità eh, di, di Peter Kubelka, che è una cosa preziosa, e voglio ringraziare eh, l'intelligenza e l'acutezza di Alexander Orbert, e, e sono sicuro che il Osterage Museum avrà un ancora una lunghissima vita. Grazie. <ride>